For substance use treatment, not using is only part of the battle. A huge factor in recovery is your environment, the place you live, the people that you hang out with. And oftentimes, this is the thing that helps someone stay sober long term. But what if you don't have a home environment that is good for recovery? Or what if you don't have friends or family members who are ready to support you during those important first pivotal days, weeks, and months of being sober? Medication management, finding a friend network, socializing sober, getting a job? Any of these things could be a stumbling block as you're trying to get your life in order. Luckily, there is sober living, also known as transitional housing. And today, we are going to unpack exactly what it is and what it is not with Ben Sigley, the Director of Housing at Sandstone Care. First, let's get a definition of sober living from Ben himself. So sober living is a safe, productive environment for individuals to focus on their recovery. And like most people who work in recovery, the reason he got into this work is kind of personal. I'm in a recovery myself, so I really relate to the individuals who come into our housing, all the way from the pre-contemplation to the ambivalence of recovery, even questioning whether or not it is possible for them, and then eventually the drive to find something different for themselves in life. I went through treatment, I got out, and I had a job um, with some people. We did fix and flips and construction and we were all in recovery, which is really cool for construction crew. And uh, a lot of the people I was working with that I would train were people that had 24 hours to maybe a week or two sober, and we're trying to teach them trade skills to fall back on so they all have, always have some way to make some money for themselves. The biggest goal of sober living is to give structure, to form new routines, ways of thinking, and daily habits. So our goal with structure is to help these individuals build a routine that's very similar to everyone else in the world. A lot of the individuals that we serve, they come into the house and they don't have any experience with a healthy sleep cycle, with basic housing responsibilities, with setting goals and moving towards those goals throughout the day. So that's what we provide. We provide that support for them. So hopefully by the end of their stay with us, they have a solid foundation to stand on so they can pursue their purpose and passion in life. Part of this support is learning how to form friendships that don't revolve around substances, relationships that stick with you even after you leave a sober living house. Well, the people in the houses together, that will likely be their support system after housing. So it's very important for us to encourage the residents to make connections and build community within the house. And the house managers do take lead on that. We have a lot of activities and group things that we do to promote those connections within the house. So a lot of it is learning how to take accountability for your actions. That's a very important thing. One of the overall goals is to uh, teach our residents how to be independent. So there's a lot of skills that go into that. Communication with those around you, setting boundaries with other people in the house and in the community, interview skills, budgeting skills, all of those things put together is really part of that solid foundation. A huge part of recovery is having people around you who know you and can help you through things. When you're struggling, you reach out to them. And if there's something going on with you, they can tell and they're asking you about it. And so that's one of our goals within the house is just to encourage the residents to make connections with each other. And sometimes it's very difficult for some people. It's very difficult to live in a house with that many other people around them. And especially with ha learning how to uphold their own boundaries. It's pretty typical that two residents in the house that for lack of better words, get on each other's nerves actually be become the closest. They actually form a bond because it's built off of that accountability and boundary piece. In addition to learning to live with other people, there are other struggles that men and women face in sober living. A majority of the people that come to sober living don't have any experience with essentially taking care of themselves and their surroundings and paying attention to the things that they do that may affect people around them. So we tackle a lot of that by just pointing things out and maybe encouraging alternatives, right? No one, some people might feel very embarrassed about leaving a towel on the floor 
So it's basically just a conversation about the alternative. Hang up your towel, let it dry off. Along that, along with that, there's something pretty interesting. Can be a lot of conflicts in the house. Someone, like you said, someone comes in the house and they're very independent. They have a lot of experience with, say, working and doing the things that they need to do. That the structure and routine is not a problem. Versus someone else who's never made their bed, never wake, woken up on time, never interviewed for a job. Sometimes those personalities can clash within the house. So that's another important skill that we're we're trying to teach is how to resolve conflict peacefully. Okay, let's break down a typical weekday at a sober living house. What can you expect? So I guess we'll say the typical weekday, wake up time is 8 a.m. All the residents come down onto the first floor and gather in a common area. And then we have morning meeting at 8.15. This is where uh, the house manager speaks with all the residents individually in the group about what their daily goals are, what steps they can take that day to reach either short-term goals or long-term goals, and how not only the other residents, but the housing team can help them achieve that goal. And we talk about a lot of things in that morning meeting. Sometimes we roll out new rules or we talk to the entire house about how things are going, the cleanliness of the house at that moment. Pretty powerful meeting, honestly. It's one of my favorite parts. After that, we do medication times and Rally Point, we do control. We do take uh, possession of all medications. All of our house managers are QMAP certified. And so that's a big piece of what we do is, is we really manage med medications closely, work closely with the medical team and the clinical team, but I'll get to that. Um, after that, it's just about residents putting one foot in front of the other and actually doing what they said they would do in the morning meeting. And that's how the house managers really get involved in encouraging them to keep moving. After that, usually the residents are out in the world interviewing for jobs, going to exercise, finding a meeting. Anything productive is, is our rule. Just be productive during the day. After that, they go to programming. Depending on the programming level, we either help them get there or they get there on their own. And then basically after that, the house manager picks up everyone from program, brings them back to the house and just does check-ins with them, assigns a daily chore. And then it's pretty fun after that. You know what I mean? It's just everyone after a long day, it's a win. If you get through that whole day and you're still sober, that's reason to celebrate. Okay, so you're working hard throughout the week, but then what about the weekend? A huge part of recovery is learning to have fun while sober. So how does that work? If you're grinding through the week, it's important to have a couple self-care days for yourself. We've all learned it at the end of the week. So yeah, when we first started the, the men's house in Denver, when I would go pick up clients, new clients from the clinical office and bring them back to the house, that was my time to ask them questions and try to get to know them. And I always asked one question was, uh, what do you do for fun? Because that's such a huge part of life. Most of the week is work and the other two days should be some fun. And so I always heard usually one of two questions. I don't know or I used to do these things, right? And obviously they had lost their passion in active addiction, as we all do. We decided that we were gonna start doing weekend activities, always something a little bit different. And uh, the residents can vote. Most of the time the housing team comes up with the ideas because everyone's obviously not really sure what they wanna do. And it's the best part of Rally Point. It's when everyone just gets to have fun and be human together and just enjoy the day, and enjoy life a little bit. And sometimes residents find something that they'd like to pursue. They find a hobby that they're just really excited about. And sometimes uh, the weekend activities are a total bust and there's something no one ever wants to do, but it's a bonding experience in, them, in itself. Everyone says, oh man, that was so terrible. And everyone agrees it's terrible. So it's like, all right, we're never gonna do that again. One great story recently is I went to play paintball, which is a house favorite in every location. And we had, we had one guy in the house in Colorado Springs who was not open to finding anything fun or a hobby to do or anything. He's very cool. And we went and played paintball. And I remember the second we started playing a game, I looked over at him and he's wearing a paintball mask, but I could see that he's grinning ear to ear. And he comes up to me, he goes, this is awesome. I said, yep, totally is. And we went back to the house after paintball and myself and all the residents sat around the table and ate dinner together. And everyone's smiling, everyone's talking about the day. And we all realized something at that moment that none of us thought about using that day. Yeah, so there's some favorites here. Paintball, go-karts are a big one. Sometimes it's like uh, the ladies' house likes to do mani-pedis. They 
insist we do you know that they do that at once a month. Some other things are sometimes we do a community service project. Sometimes we just do barbecues and cookouts, which is a really big one too. Sometimes we do indoor climbing. Oh, hiking is a big one, especially here in Boulder and in Colorado Springs. There's beautiful hiking trails right outside the door. Sandstone care sober living houses are gender separated, like most are. But one thing that is unique about them is that they're specifically for young adults. So that 18 to 30 year old range. And when you have people who are from all different stages of life, as Ben says, things can get a little bit interesting. With the 18 to 30 year old range, it's very interesting because you really do get a lot of different people, a wide variety of, of people from different backgrounds and different experience. And we find that it, it's really helpful within the house sometimes because the older residents can really learn something from the younger residents. And also there's, a, there's an opportunity to actually give back a little bit. Like, I've been where you are. Let me try to help you. And also, obviously, the younger residents see the older residents and they're like, that's kind of what I want to be if they're doing well, or I can learn something from these people. A lot of what we deal with is actually a failure to launch type of situations where individuals come in and they, at any age, right, any age, they don't really have the life experience because they're coming straight from family's house. So that's always something interesting. Usually the older people and the younger people kind of butt heads a little bit and it's cool to bridge the gap there. Since all this stuff that people experience is kind of new, how does a sober living house help someone adjust? Something I see a lot is some basic reasons for that life position is uncomfortability. What lies ahead scares me and I'm comfortable where I am right now and so I'm just gonna stay where I am. So it can be a shock to the system for some people when they come into this structured sober living house and they hear uh, all the rules and, and all the other residents try to show them what's happening in the house and the responsibilities. It can be super overwhelming. We totally understand that. And so it's really important for the housing team to meet them where they're at. The goals that we talked about before, those are not housing team goals. Those are the individuals and they can start out with really small goals. I want to learn how to be around people without being anxious. I want to get a job or even learn how to ride the bus sorts of things. And we are more than happy to help with those goals. All right, let's make this real. I asked Ben to share a story that stuck out for him from his time as housing director. So one that comes to mind is an individual who came to our men's house in Denver and he was totally resistant to the whole process. And so he had a lot of external motivation. The family wanted him to be there. He was actually going through some legal issues. And really, he said to me at one point, he said, I'm just here until the court lets me go. I'm just here to look good in front of my you know, prosecutor, probation officer. And he, when we talked about conflict resolution skills, he was like our toughest case for sure. Almost every day it was an attempt to resolve some conflict between he and another resident or him and staff and those types of things. But at first it was just basically this resistance and then it started to evolve into, uh, he would really start contemplating what you're saying to him. He would take some accountability for it and then you started to see everything change for him. We have the system within the house where usually the resident who's been there the longest, we identify as a senior resident, maybe the top two. And then they take on some of the structure pieces in the house and start leading the house essentially. And it got to a point where we offered him the senior resident position and he did. So we said, okay, let's just give you a few pieces of it, a few things to see how you like it. And at that point we could really see just this new person coming from him. It, at that point, we're just seeing this person evolve when they came in in totally pre-contemplative state. I don't want to do this, total resistance to evolve into a position where he was so impressed by the person that he was becoming and he was so excited about the things that he was doing and the fact that he's actually achieving these goals one at, one at a time, small goals to big goals. And he started just doing really cool stuff. And he started leading the house. We had 12 men in that house and he was the one that everyone looked to. A new resident came in and he would teach them how the house works and he would encourage them and all those types of things. And he transitioned out of the house and with every resident, we're not 100% sure how they're gonna do out there. Cause just it's a shock coming into the house, it's a shock leaving the house. And we lost contact with him, with him for a few months and we were you know, all pretty curious about how he was doing. And 
he gave us a call one day and he said, man, I just got a year sober. I just went and got my one year coin. And it was exciting for us. And he's been sober ever since. And I think he just hit three years. And he still wakes up at 8 a.m. He still makes his bed every day. If you're thinking about sober living for you or a loved one, Ben has something that he really, really wants to get across. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. I know exactly what it's like to be stuck in that cycle. You feel like you're alone, even when there's people around you. You feel like no one understands you. And above all, you feel like even if other people can do it, you can because you're different than them. And while every human being is obviously unique and special, we all go through essentially the same things. And so my advice for people is just to give it a shot. Come see what we're doing. It'll be difficult at times. It'll be very rewarding. It'll be challenging, but it'll also be fun as well because recovery is awesome. And uh, just take a chance. Like you said about the well-rounded support here, that's what keeps us going. That is the most meaningful thing about Sandstone Care, in my opinion, is just we all, every team member, we all collaborate together from the front end admissions to discharge planning and everything in between, clinical team, a family therapist, housing. We provide such well-rounded support for people because we are all in this because we truly want to help people. 100%, that's the most important thing in our lives. And, uh, and housing with uh, our housing team who are not in need of uh, sober living services, which is something that sets us apart from other sober livings. They are employees of Sandstone. Housing team, clinical team, and family together surrounding the client, they have a really good chance. Listen, y'all, living sober, it's real, but it's also more common than you think. And best of all, all that worry, anxiety, and fear that comes along with doing new things and living in a different way, it's also treatable. All my love, I'll see you on the next episode.